All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you here from a lovely sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by Scott McCain, who is in an equally nice, maybe probably slightly hotter Las Vegas. How are you doing? I'm doing great, John. I was in San Diego all last week uh, speaking at a conference and, uh, you know, your your uh, temperatures in the uh, mid 70s sure sounds appealing when it's 108 here right now. So. I, I know I was actually I was in uh, I was in Phoenix a, a couple of weeks ago uh, and uh, it went up to 116. So, oh, my gosh, <laughs> well, it's, it's a dry heat. It's but, a dry but heat. So is your oven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Scott is a writer, speaker, pre presenter. He's uh, he uh, writes books and presentations that uh, clearly reveal how to create more compelling, compelling, easy for me to say, connections between you, your team, and your customers. And today, we want to. That's what we want to talk about today. Is we want to talk about uh, creating distinction. And I love that phrase, creating distinction. So, Thanks. Scott, what do you mean by creating distinction? Well, I, one of the things that occurs to me, John, is that it, no matter how good we are at sales, customers don't choose us. Instead, they choose us instead of the, the myriad of alternatives they have out there in this hyper-competitive marketplace. So if, if what you're selling appears to the customer to be roughly equivalent to what I'm selling, then the only way they're going to be able to make a choice is through price. And, and none of us in sales want that. Right. So what I've tried to research is what does it take to stand out from your competition? How do, how do you create distinctions so that we're not only out there selling, but simultaneously we're attracting customers to do business with us by what we stand for, the word of mouth that we have, uh, all of those components that make up for a profitable organization. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because today with uh, everything being so digital and almost hands off and uh, it's very easy for salespeople to hide behind technology and that and to not really be able to create the distinction you're talking about, right? Well, you're exactly right. And, and I think we've seen more change in sales in the last 10 years than we might have seen in the 100 before that. I mean, but one of my biggest clients is Volkswagen Group. Uh -huh. uh, so it's Volkswagen, Porsche, Audi, uh, Bentley, Lamborghini, Bugatti. And regardless of whether you're talking about going in for a Lamborghini or whether you're talking about going in for a baseline Volkswagen, their customer today walks in the dealership armed with more information than they've ever had. They, in some cases, know as much or more than the salesperson about dealer incentives and all the things, depending on how deeply they want to dig. And so what we have to understand is that dynamic has changed for, for so long. We as salespeople had the advantage of superior information and many times we can't claim that anymore. So we have to find alternative ways of, of making our point. And I, I think customers more than ever are coming to us for it, wisdom more than information. They're coming to us more for insight and how we deliver that is, is incredibly important. Yeah, no, 100%, uh, because you're, you're correct. Uh, you can get all of the information, but to, to get that wisdom, as you say, or insight or something that you couldn't possibly know or something that you haven't been able to find out makes all the difference. And uh, the other thing, just using the, the car example, is uh, you're right. I mean, they come in armed with a lot of information. And the other challenge that, and this faces a lot of companies, in the minds of the consumer or the customer, yeah, maybe there's not such a great difference now between all the different cars, right? And so, therefore, right. you right. have to, you know, brands of, of product. So, how do you go about really creating, uh, distinct, distinguishing and being distinctive when, in the eyes, rightly or wrongly, or the perception of the consumer, things are somewhat commoditized. Well, you know, I don't think anything is required to be a commodity. I, mm -hmm. I agree with you. They certainly are. But if you think about it, Starbucks differentiated coffee, Evian differentiated water. Mm -hmm. So any product could be differentiated based on a number of things that I call the four cornerstones of distinction. But, but to your point, I think the experience created by the dealership is is going to make all the difference in the world. And and one of the challenges I see in many businesses, and we're using cars as an sure. example, but I, as you have pointed out, I mean, we, could, we can make this point in just about any industry. What we have to do, I think, changes in terms of as sales professionals, even in terms of sales managers and how compensation is created, that, that we need to be compensating people more for second and third and fourth and repeat buyers than the initial sale so that it, be, it becomes part of our reward system 
to stay in touch with customers, to encourage the repeat business, and to make these things happen. Because behavior rewarded is behavior repeated. And if we want to have that behavior repeated, then our compensation has to be rewarded in the right way. Yeah, and I think I'm 100% again. And I think, uh, as you're saying, the experience that the customer has over a long period of time is what really counts. And the trouble with that is that you only need to drop the ball once for it to color the whole experience, right? It never works the other way around. You can have <laughs> like 50 bad experiences and one good experience doesn't wipe out the 50 bad, but you can have 50 good and the one bad one will wipe out the, the others. No, it's so true. One of my other good clients is United Airlines, you know, and, and one of the things I wrote a while back was that, you know, I was on a United flight and, and you know, nobody knew that I was a speaker for him or anything. Yeah. And, and I see this flight attendant holding the hands of a little, you know, a little boy who was a, a minor traveling alone, right? Probably going from one parent to, mm -hmm. to another. And she held his hand and, you know, talked to him and, you know, made him laugh and dry his tears. Well, nobody, nobody talks about that. Now, <laughs> you know, drag somebody off a plane and it's yeah, exactly. uh, 20 million views on YouTube. <laughs> it, it, so you're exactly right. And it's, it's another thing that we haven't really ever had happen in human history before where everything can be recorded, where everything yeah. can be, you know, you, you, you have a difficult conversation with a customer. They can be recording it on their iPhone or their pocket. So we as salespeople, I, I, I think are under more challenge and pressure than, than what we've ever been. And isn't it interesting that as technology increases, how we set ourselves apart as sales professionals is going to be through the, the personal connection that, that we create. Harvey did a recent uh, article that said the fundamental change in B2B sales is it's becoming more like B2C. Mm -hmm. So whether we are selling business to business or business direct to consumer, what everybody is looking for now is the experience that makes them want to choose you instead of the competition. But, but in many cases, we're woefully unprepared to deliver that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because for the longest time, we had this, I think it's kind of a strange uh, notion that how we operated as consumers in our personal life and our B2C uh, interactions, that somehow when we walked through the door and we put on our B2B hat, everything <laughs> changed, right? Yeah. And Guess what? It's the same people, right? At the end of the day, we're, we're, yeah. so so if we if we demand something from our B to C experience, it stands to reason that we're going to demand that from our B to B. And what I want to come back to is just the point that you made, which is a really really important one, is the human connection is becoming more, not less important. And I think that's something that I'd like you to elaborate on because I think that's critical for people to understand. Well, you know, I, I in my very first book that came out. 20 years ago, uh, it was entitled All Business is Show Business because uh, I, had, I had for a decade, I had the greatest part-time job in the world as I was building my speaking, writing, and consulting business. I, I was a movie critic. I, I was syndicated to 100 television stations uh, across the country, and I would review movies. So then I got to interview the celebrities and attend the, the, you know, the screenings and all that kind of thing. And one of the things I learned was that what Hollywood knew is something that all of us in sales need to know. All right? a, a movie is successful when it creates the desired emotional connection with the audience. Mm -hmm. It's not just song and dance. It's not just making us laugh. I mean, Schindler's List is a product of show business. It is creating that emotional connection with the audience that you desire. Well, that's what we, I said this two decades ago, that's what we need in business. Instead, we talk more about service, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Services, we answer the phone on time. We yeah. don't keep the customer waiting. Our, our, our sales materials look pretty and our, our showroom is clean. But the experience is that compelling emotional connection. And unfortunately, we haven't talked much about that in business or not nearly as much as we should. I think that's why we see the terms like transparency and authenticity coming into the forefront is because that's the baseline to create an experience. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, customer loyalty is only generated through emotion. I, mm -hmm. I will never be loyal to a product or service toward which I have no feeling. Yeah. So if we don't, as sales professionals, create emotion, then there's no way that we can create the experience. And without the experience, I don't think we have repeat customers. No, and I think you're, you're, you're correct, is that without, that without that emotional connection, everything, and, and we live in a world where pretty much everything is swappable, right? I yeah. mean, you can swap things out. There used to be this whole idea of switching costs, and once you got embedded, it was hard to get out. I think those days are gone now, because I don't think it's yeah. the same. And I think you're correct. There has to be 
an emotional attachment. And what you mentioned about service, you're hundred percent correct again, is that those are baseline things. Those are yeah. things that you expect, right? You need to be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it, it's hard to do when we really, one, one of the things that I, I, I talk about is that there are three levels to the customer experience and they're progressive. So if you don't get it right at level one, what you do at level three doesn't matter. Level one is is just basic processing. It's it's what the customer has a right to expect. So when I'm flying United or Delta or American or whoever, you know, I, I expect the plane to be clean. I mm -hmm. expect the flight to leave reasonably on time unless there's weather or or something. Yeah. You know, I mean, th those I expect it to be safe. I bought a ticket to Chicago, not a chance to Chicago, right? So, <laughs> I, 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 those are things I think I have a right to expect. If they don't get that right, nothing else matters. But then I ask the companies I work with, okay, so where's where's your list of what your customers have or have a right to expect every time? And the vast majority of businesses go, we, we don't have the list. <laughs> so if you don't get that right, nothing matters. Okay, so once you get that, then level two is service. And, and service are those activities that we undertake to make it more efficient mm -hmm. to do business with us. And it's smiling and it's connecting and it's answering the phone quickly. And all of that. It's the flight attendant serving you coffee on the plane. If the plane is crashing into the ground, I don't care how hot the coffee is, right? <laughs> so uh, processing has to come first, then a service. But the experience is level three because it adds the elements of personalization and emotion. Mm -hmm. You're not selling a car. You're, you're helping me solve a problem, whether it's mm -hmm. getting something bigger to take the kids to school or whether it's something sporty. So I feel young and energetic at whatever it might be. Right. I mean, you're, you're making it personal. And with that personalization comes the emotion and that's where loyalty is generated because when we create that emotional connectivity, it's the same thing as in movies of why we want to see the sequel. Yes. It's the same thing in movies. You know, one of the biggest buyers of, uh, of streaming movies and in former days, DVDs were people that had already seen the movie. Right, right, right. Right. They wanted to repeat the experience. Same thing is true in, in whatever sales that we're in. We want our customers to be so engaged and, and so connected with the experience. They want to repeat it and refer it. And, yeah. and that only happens at level three. Yeah. And what and, and as you said, using the movie uh, analogy there. And what's the next thing they wanted to do is they want they want you to watch it. Yes, they exactly. Your friends, you got to say you've got to watch this movie, and I yeah. think you're 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 absolutely correct. If uh, if you if you fly in an airline and the, and it's clean and you get there on time, somebody says, "How was your flight?" Fine. Yeah, um, it was great. It was fine. Uh, yeah. But if something happened to you that you weren't expecting, that extra level, right? right. Then you're going to say, "Yeah, it was actually it was fantastic because here's what happened." Exactly. Right. And it's why Southwest, which has yeah. uh, become a cliche, right? Sure. But Southwest, it's, it's why customers love them because they tell jokes on the flight, you know, and that's one of the worst things about living in Vegas is a lot of times they'll do a raffle drawing on the flight, <laughs> you know, and after your 47th Southwest flight of playing the game. But to support the point that you were making, I, it, and it's absolutely true, I had the chance to spend some time with James Cameron, the director. Oh, right. And I said, okay, so you directed Titanic and then you directed Avatar. And at that time, the two biggest movies in the history of film what was the key and he said people would go see it and then they would tell a friend you've got to go see this and i will bring you with me mm -hmm. and so to exactly to your point that's how the two biggest uh, avengers uh, the latest avengers movies now the number one but those two movies he said that's exactly how they did it was it was so compelling that not only did you want to see it again but the second time you saw it you wanted to bring a friend gosh what business doesn't want that Right. Exactly. So, so how do you do that? Because that's not something, I mean, that's something that you have to consciously decide to do. That's yeah. not something that you can leave up to chance, right? Exactly. That's, that's where my four cornerstones come in from the book, uh, create distinction. Uh, the, the, the first one is clarity. We've got to be crystal clear about what our advantages are. And uh, boy, I got to tell you, one of the su surprising things to me is how few organizations and how few sales professionals really have that. Mm -hmm. Retail Marketing Federation did a study and they said that 70% of frontline salespeople in retail stores cannot answer the question, 
why is it better to buy from you than from your competition? Yeah, I could believe that. Mm -hmm. Right. I think sometimes some of the, the, the marketing that organizations need to do is internally mm -hmm. uh, more than externally, because if your own people haven't bought in, it's really hard for them to sell to sure. somebody else. So we've got to be crystal clear about what our advantages are. That sounds easy, but I've, I've done multiple day workshops just doing that cornerstone mm -hmm. with folks. Second one is creativity. Then let's, let's give it a little twist. Let's innovate in some way. But the, and again, when we hear the old cliche about think outside the box, I think the fundamental problem is we haven't defined the box to begin <laughs> yeah. with. So we don't know when we're thinking out of it or, exactly. it or what, right? And so we don't even know where the box is. Yeah, you're exactly <laughs> right. And so what, what we have to do is just find a little twist. And one of the things I recommend specifically on this is look to another organization outside your industry. I mean, it'd be a great question to say, okay, if, if Disney was in our business, why would they do this? Right. If Apple was in our business, how would they? If Southwest was in our business, how would they do this? And just try to think through and be creative with that. And here's the, it only takes one thing. We, we tend to think that innovation is disruptive and blows everything up. I mean, enterprise rental car, all they did was bring the car to you rather than you go get the yeah. car. It was mm -hmm. the same Chevy. It was the same Ford that Hertz and Avis had. They did one thing creatively, and now they're the biggest in that industry. So mm -hmm. it only takes one creative idea. Third is communication, and that's that's the power of narrative. It's it's telling a story. Uh, it, it's the one communication device that unites us regardless of generation. Mm -hmm. Baby boomers love stories. Gen Xers love stories. Millennials love stories. We all love a compelling story. Yet what we find with a lot of salespeople is that they don't know how to tell a mm -hmm. story. They don't they're good at telling it, but it's poorly constructed. Yeah. And by the way, not just generationally, but culturally, because most yes. most cultures have a, most cultures have an oral tradition as well, and that's how uh, the you know the culture has been handed down. So everybody can relate to storytelling. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And and interestingly enough, regardless of the culture or the generation, the basic rules of constructing a story are the same. Yeah. So it, that's what we have to learn. As sales professionals, like a lot of time. Times we've, you know, we've fallen back on our, our our gift of gab, our ability to to be verbal, but yet we haven't. Here's here's a fundamental. I, I was just working in when I was there in San Diego, working with a, a large group of financial advisors, and they were great at telling the story. They just weren't great at constructing it. Somebody would have a problem, and they'd begin the story at the end, at the conclusion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> here's how I'll fix that. Here's how I'll solve that. Well, well, what if you went to a movie and boy meets girl, they fall in love, get married, the end, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, that's no movie. That's yeah. so, so we, we have to learn the, the construct of that, the, the, the template that, that works there. And then the fourth and final is a customer experience focus. It is a obsession with how does it feel to do business with us? Mm -hmm. what, what does it feel like? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we make it feel more engaging and transparent and connective when, when we're doing business. So if you follow those four cornerstones, the, the end result is you, you, you tend to stand out. You're distinctive in your respective marketplace. Yeah, and I love that. And especially the last one there where you talked about what does it feel like to do business with us? I had an experience um, many years ago when I took over I took over running an organization and one of the first things I did as the as the new CEO was I said, okay, line me up some customers and I'll go visit them. And, yeah, uh, great and idea. Chat. So I went off on my little uh, odyssey and it was shocked me that many of them said, love your products, love your services. It's really great. Your people do an awesome job. You're just really hard to do business with. And I was like, what? And they said, you know, we want to do stuff with you, but you're really hard to do business with. And this was said mm -hmm. by a number of customers. And I'm like, so when you sit back and you're thinking, oh, hang on a second, there's people who actually want to give us money and we're making yeah. it hard for them to do it. <laughs> But it happens more yeah. often than we know. And, and here's the other problem. A lot of CEOs aren't going out and doing exactly what you did, right? They're, they're believing what people tell oh, our price is too high or our competitor has got a better product or whatever. And, and you're exactly right. Getting that information from the customer is so valuable. The, the genesis of all disruption is dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so when we eliminate that friction, the, the, those those points where you're tough to do business with because, oh, we've always done it that way or yeah. it's company policy or all those things we hear too much too often. When we, when we eliminate that, that's one of the first steps that it takes to, to create. Our, our 
little business here owns the trademark on the term ultimate customer experience. And, mm -hmm. and that's how you create the ultimate customer experience is you, you, you begin by saying, what if everything went exactly right? Uh-huh. Right. That's, From the moment, I mean, way. if everything went perfectly and, and I get groups to do this, like if you got a retail store, customer walks in and, and the, the three most important words are, and then what? Yeah. Right? Customer walks in and then what? Well, somebody walks up to him. Well, and then why? What, what do you say? How do you welcome them? How much space do you give them to shop around? <laughs> or do you ask? I mean, you, you go through and you write out what would be a perfect customer experience. And then you say, okay, now what, what in the process, what in the systems do we have to change to, to make this better? What, in, in my latest book, Iconic, one of the things I found in the research that was uh, fascinating to me was that most companies don't go negative enough. Mm. In other words, if a customer has a problem, they placate that customer. They do what it takes to make that customer feel nice, but they don't go deeply enough to fix the process that created that dissatisfied customer along the way. So for your example, I'm sure that you had a people on your team that if the customer said, oh, you're tough to do business with, well, let us give you five more. Yeah, well, let us, you know, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to going back and saying, wait a minute, where are they tough? You know, <laughs> where are we messing this up? What's the process that made them say that to begin with? When we do that, now we're on the way of creating that ultimate customer experience that makes us distinctive in a competitive marketplace. Exactly. And you will often find the root at the root of all of this is is internal processes that you have created Absolutely. to make life easy for yourselves as opposed to ever looking about what impact it has on the customer. I haven't read it yet because I just saw it on email right before we started talking, but evidently the cover of the new Harvard Business Review says this, and I can't believe that Harvard, <laughs> you know, is saying this, it, the, the headline is, are metrics ruining your business? Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank goodness somebody <laughs> is finally saying that. I, a while back, I had this chance to, to do this keynote speech for a group. It was a, uh, 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 the, the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgeons. So it was the, you know, the, all the, the cosmetic surgeons, plastic surgeons of the world. <laughs> And one of the things I found out in my so research. Did they all look alike or were they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Their partners did. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, they, they yeah. were they were a fascinating group. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I found out that I had no idea is they were saying you could graduate from from medical school. You could do your internship, you could do your residency, you could build your practice and never be required to take a class on bedside manner, the patient uh, experience. Uh, well. Right? So I started talking about that in my speeches and I had a, a CEO come up to me and he, he's like holding his chest and he said, you know, I just realized something. He said, I have an MBA and I never had to take a class on the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And we have educated and trained an entire generation of leaders who are fabulous at looking at balance sheets and P&L statements and understand EBITDA and the share impact, uh, you know, on, on, on particular activities and really haven't been educated in the importance of the customer experience and how to deliver it. And I think that's one of the sea changes that's happening now because customers are demanding it, but most organizational leadership is woefully unprepared to deliver it. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and I think this is a great place to to end as we're bumping up against the end of our time. But that was a great, great uh, statement to end with because I, I I absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And actually, it's funny you should mention the bedside manner. If you ever... If you're ever looking for a new doctor or a provider of some kind, medical provider, and you happen to go to any of those review sites or whatever, yeah. that is the number one thing you will see. People come up and uh, negative ones will say terrible bedside manner. Ter you know, yeah. not it's never like bad skills as a doctor. Rare, it's rarely. It's normally their their attitude. Absolutely, <laughs> and most malpractice suits are filed because of uh, poor bedside manner, <laughs> poor client relationships, patient relationships. <laughs> than on, uh, you know, uh, an, an error in judgment. Yeah. It, it's it's absolutely amazing. But you know what? They the, the malpractice insurance firms, AIG and others, they study that. They survey that. Yet those of us with smaller businesses, we just think, well, they didn't have the money. Uh, or, well, you know, the competition cut the price. Yeah. Or they must have a relative working, you know, yeah. or, you know, whatever. Not realizing it, it was our inability to make that in incredible connection yeah. that, that determines where people buy. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Listen, uh, Scott McCain, this has been fantastic. Before we go, I'd like you to let people know a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you. Oh, gosh. You. That's so kind. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me let me throw a couple things. Uh, my website that tells about my speaking, my books and everything, my blog, is just scottmccain.com. And by the way, my last name is spelled M-C-K. 
M-C-C-A-I-N, frequently misspelled. Mm-hmm. So scottmccain.com. And on Twitter, you can connect with me or on LinkedIn. It's just Scott McCain, all one word. And I, I look forward to connecting and uh, communicating with uh, with anybody that would, would like to do so. <laughs> Excellent. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, CRM. Fantastic interview. Uh, see you all for another expert insight very soon. Thank you.